with the court's budget request. America and the Courts, Saturday evening at 7 Eastern on C-SPAN. And again Sunday morning at 8 Eastern on C-SPAN 2. On Sunday nights, C-SPAN brings you coverage of the British elections. Over the next two Sundays, we'll take you to the campaign trail to see speeches and other events with the major candidates for Prime Minister. That's Sunday nights at 9, Eastern and Pacific, here on C-SPAN. Now a hearing on civility in the U.S. House. A House Rules Subcommittee met today to start looking at how members conduct themselves and the tone of floor debate and political rhetoric. A former chief of staff for the Rules Committee testifies. Congressman David Dreyer chairs this 45-minute hearing. Subcommittee will come to order. Uh, the purpose of uh, this hearing is to examine a number of issues raised by uh, Professor Kathleen Hall Jamison in her report entitled Civility in the House of Representatives. Dr. Jamison is the Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania. Her report was prepared for the bipartisan congressional retreat which was held last month in Hershey, Pennsylvania. Last July I was approached by uh, my colleagues David Skaggs and Ray LaHood and asked to sign a letter to our respective party leaders requesting that they convene a bipartisan weekend retreat at the beginning of the 105th Congress. Since an event of this nature had uh, never been planned before, and given the political environment in the House at that time, I was uh, naturally skeptical that a bipartisan retreat could be held or that it could change the culture of this institution. Nonetheless, I signed the letter because I believe greater civility in the House is a cause certainly worth pursuing. This is not to suggest the decline in civil behavior in Congress is unprecedented and spiraling out of control. In fact, the institution is today more civil than it was during the 19th century and uh, many parts of this century. Um, throughout the planning, I often pointed out uh, a number of things, and I'll seize this opportunity to do the same. Uh, according to the Encyclopedia of the United States Congress, the institution during the 19th century was, for, the most, for most of the century, an unruly arena to which poured men of vastly differing cultures, education, experiences, and temperaments. From frontier states came rugged individualists, some more accustomed to settling disputes with fists or weapons than with gentlemanly compromise. From the South came a number of hot-tempered aristocrats schooled in the manly arts, brave to a fault, and alert to any slur on their honor. So, uh, well, we haven't witnessed uh, in recent years any canings or pistol whippings, uh, at least on the House floor. Uh, there is evidence of a decline of uh, debate decorum generally, certainly over the time that I've served in this House. Uh, this has created obstacles to uh, productive legislative activity, and it sets an undesirable tone for political discussion generally. I was honored to serve on the original bipartisan uh, retreat planning committee uh, for personal reasons, I was unable to attend the retreat, but it was by all accounts a tremendous success, and I want to thank the Pew Charitable Trust, the Aspen Institute, and the Congressional Institute for funding and organizing the event. It demonstrated their deep commitment to improving the quality of leadership and discourse in American society, both public and private. It was the first time in history that every member of the House of Representatives had been invited to meet informally outside of Washington, D.C., and free from the pressures of political and partisan competition. About 200 members of the House and their families uh, ultimately attended the retreat. But more important, as a result of the retreat, there is better scrutiny of the norms of behavior in the House and a greater awareness of how our behavior is projected to the American people. Despite some uh, recent uh, setbacks that have gotten a great deal of attention, uh, David Skaggs and Ray LaHood have been diligent in following up on the retreat to ensure that long-term institutional mechanisms are put in place to create a more civil, cooperative, and productive work environment while allowing vigorous debate to flourish. This hearing is intended to be a small part of that effort. We have a distinguished list of witnesses uh, who have a number of excellent observations and suggestions to share with us about the institution, uh, about the institutional environment here in the House. Uh, their written statements can be obtained on the internet 
since I had the privilege of sharing the first uh, totally interactive hearing last year, I can't hesitate to point to um, the uh, following internet address, http colon slash slash www.house.gov slash rule. Uh, is it underline? It says rule here. Rules, excuse me, rules underline, O-R-G. It's another typo you didn't find. Uh, in a few weeks, the transcript of this hearing without typos will also be made available on that website. Uh, I also want to encourage those who may be watching this hearing on C-SPAN to uh, give us their feedback and comments and suggestions, either in writing or clicking on the feedback link on our subcommittee website. Again, that internet address is http colon slash slash www.house.gov slash rules underscored org. At this point, uh, I ask unanimous consent that uh, any feedback we receive from the public that is relevant to the, relevant to the topic of today's hearing be included in the hearing uh, record without objection uh, that will uh, take place. Before I introduce our panel, I uh, would like to uh, call uh, on my very distinguished colleague, from uh, Florida, who is the vice chairman of this subcommittee, Mr. diaz Ballard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to commend you for holding this hearing. I look forward to uh, uh, hearing from our distinguished uh, guests. Um, I think that it was very important for you to point out, uh, albeit briefly, some historical perspective on the issue that we're dealing with today. Uh, not only uh, uh, do we see examples uh, in the history of our Congress of uh, physical violence and the, the famous duels that used to occur here, which I guess were not uncivil, but they were somewhat violent. Um, I don't know that there are any duels that have been terribly civil. But, uh, <laughs> well, I think they were supposed to be civil, but however, yeah. however they, they, uh, it, is, it is fortunate they have passed into the history books. Uh, but there, there was a significant amount of uncivility or lack of civility and um, and uh, even today, even today, we see uh, around uh, the world in other democracies, I think examples, significant examples of uh, parliaments where uh, recurring examples of disrespect and, and even interruptions of debate occur. Uh, and so it's important to keep these perspectives, these comparisons in mind. Uh, and yet, and yet, uh, build upon and improve our system to make it ever more not only efficient uh, for the consideration of issues and legislation, but also uh, for the consideration and respect of individual members and thus their constituents' views. And so th that's why this hearing is as it is important. Uh, and uh, again, I commend you for holding it and look forward to uh, what we will learn and the discourse uh, and the dialogue uh, that uh, uh, should ensue. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. diaz Ballart. I'm now pleased to call on the uh, ranking minority member of the subcommittee, uh, Mr. Hall. Tony. Thank you, Mr. Dreyer, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing. I think it's an important hearing. I think every member of Congress has uh, a vested interest and an interest, not only in this, but we, we feel it, we understand it, and uh, we live it every day. So I want to thank the chairman for holding this hearing. I, I look forward to uh, the type of uh, debate, the type of testimony that will come about. I think any procedural change that affects the right of a House member to express his views is a, is a sensitive subject. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. I have a written statement, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, it will appear in the record. Thank Ms. You. Myrick. Thank you very much. Let me, uh, before I introduce the panel, say that uh, it is uh, fascinating that at this moment uh, we will, following one minutes, and uh, I'm told a, a journal vote or a quorum call, uh, be hearing from the speaker on the House floor who will make a presentation as to how he is uh, dealing with the uh, ethics issue, uh, which we've all gone through for a long period of time. So I'll just say that uh, when that takes place, we're going to recess uh, for at least part of that uh, time uh, because uh, I think a number of us, and certainly people here, are welcome to go into uh, sit in the gallery and observe that at that time. 
So let me, uh, as we uh, move along, proceed with the uh, introduction of uh, both members of the first panel. Dr. Kathleen Hall Jamison is, as I said in my opening statement, the Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and the author of the report that's the subject of this hearing. Her report entitled Civility in the House of Representatives was prepared for the bipartisan congressional retreat held last month in Hershey in uh, 1992. The New York Times called Dr. Jamison the leading academic authority on politics and advertising. She's the author of two recent books, one entitled The Interplay of Influence, News, Advertising, Politics, and the Mass Media, and the other entitled Packaging, the Presidency, a History and Criticism of Presidential Campaign Advertising. Dr. Jamison even uh, served a stint as a Hill staffer in the late 1970s as the Communications Director for the House Permanent Select Committee on Aging, which uh, we abolished in 1993. Uh, and uh, our uh, other witness on the panel is uh, Mr. Donald Wolf Wolfensberger. One of the uh, concerns that have been raised over the level of turnover in the House is that we're losing our institutional memory. Uh, until his departure uh, just a couple of months ago as staff director of this full rules committee, uh, Don Wolfensberger was the, the institutional memory of the House of Representatives, having served 28 years as a congressional staff member, 22 of them on uh, the Rules Committee. Anyone who doubts that he was deserving of that title was not uh, at his retirement party, which was held right here in this room in attendance. We had uh, former congressman and presidential candidate John Anderson, who first brought Don to town here, uh, former congresswoman and labor secretary Lynn Martin, the Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott, uh, the former House Minority Leader Bob Michael, um, among others. His departure was uh, a great loss uh, personally for many of us and for this institution, but we're now able to utilize his expertise and his new capacity as guest scholar at the uh, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and uh, I want to welcome him back to this uh, hearing room and, and say that uh, both of your entire statements will appear in the record, and we look forward to uh, your testimony. If you want to begin, Kathleen. First, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and extend my, the personal regards of the founder of the school, Walter Annenberg, uh, Thank to you. you very much. He's a great, great man. The, the premise of our report was that the norm in the House is a civil norm. And it's important to remember that those moments in which incivility is at issue are, in fact, very rare, which doesn't mean that we shouldn't be concerned about it. But often lost in this discussion is the fact that day in and day out, most of the discourse that occurs in the House is thoughtful and evidence-driven and is not in any way what one would consider to be problematic. And one of the reasons I think that the public thinks that this problem is worse than it is, and I don't mean to say there isn't a problem, is that there's a tendency on the part of the news media to take those moments that are disruptive and to feature them and to feature them repeatedly without drawing attention to the fact that in most of those moments in which there has been problematic speech, the institution has dealt well. And also that the member who has overstepped the lines has more often than not apologized to the person offended as well as to the institution. And so my first point is that civility, in fact, is the norm. It's important to remember that. Secondly, I think it's important to, to note that our premise differs from some, because we believe that comity works in service of strong partisanship. It does not work against strong partisanship. We don't mean to confuse the notion that, that discourse should be based on mutual trust with the notion that one should be effectively co-opted and one's voice ought not to be heard. One of the things that is true historically is that when the minority feels obstructed or the majority feels thwarted or both occur simultaneously, as is likely, incivility is more likely to occur. And so any changes that one makes that increase the likelihood that the minority will feel obstructive, obstructed, obstructed, is more likely to increase incivility, not to increase it. It is as important as a result as one looks at ways to change and shift the culture or small moves in the rules that one be conscious that we're, have, we have a common goal, which is constructive deliberation, and that in the process, the free airing of views is our goal, and that what we're trying to extinguish is not that partisanship, but the kind of counterproductive name-calling that occasionally occurs. I would like, then, in that context, to briefly summarize our findings. We examined the instances in which words were taken down from 1935 to 1996, and we found that, and this is a reassuring finding, there is not an increasing dramatic trend toward word demands that words be taken down. 
In fact, consistent with my earlier premise, for much of the history of the modern institution, the norm suggests that that is a rarely used move on the part of the House. There is a spike in 1946, which is the year before the turnover to the Republican Congress of 47-48. There is a spike again in the first session of the 104th. But then in the second session of the 104th, that spike goes back down, which suggests that the natural adaptive mechanisms of the House began to address some of those concerns. It's natural, I think, to assume that when one party has been in power for 40 years and the other party has been out of power for 40 years, the transition is going to be difficult. And I think we saw that in that first year. I think, as a result, what we see is a healthy institution that has natural adaptive tendencies. And the question one should ask is, how can one increase the likelihood of those tendencies operate? We saw, secondly, the exact same pattern when we looked at the chair asking that the House be in order or suggesting that the gentle lady or gentleman suspend. 1995, you see a spike, but you see a dropping in 1996. We looked at vulgarity in the House, and there's a vulgarity chart in the report that we've submitted. I will not indicate to you the words in the vulgarity chart. Uh, and we found that the level of vulgarity actually dropped um, somewhat in the 104th Congress, which is suggestive of the fact that at least in that dimension, this problem isn't, isn't worsening in that Congress. Uh, but we did find one trend that was problematic, and that is that when we looked at the early history of words taken down, meaning the 1930s and 40s, when the word liar was used, it was not usually used to describe another person involved in an exchange with the member. In fact, into the 1990s, the, or sorry, the late 1980s, that also was not the case. We tended to call our foreign enemies liars, but we didn't tend to call each other liars. In the 103rd Congress, which is before the turnover, the number of times that members called each other liars began to spike, and that trend has continued. What that suggests is that we have a problem on the margin that, and that it deals directly with a specific rule of the House, which says that you can't impugn the integrity of another member. And the question, I think, then is, uh, are there ways to minimize those occasions in which one moves to that level of attack, which I think is not productive in discourse? We made a, a series of recommendations in the report that, that were, based, were, pred were predicated on our two premises. And so the, the recommendations that we made were, were based on the assumption that there, in fact, are in the existing rules the latitude to do most of what one needs to do if one is simply trying to head off moments in which there's direct impugning of someone else's integrity. Uh, we know, for example, that Rule 1, Clause 2 gives the chair the, the uh, obligation to preserve order and decorum. We know that the chair, as well as members, uh, in Rule 14, Clause 4, have the power to call to order a member who has transgressed the rules. And so if what one is suggesting is that Within the existing culture, members be more cautious and, and work more to minimize the likelihood that their own side is going to engage in direct name calling or impugning integrity, or that in those instances in which the debate is moving to that trajectory, the chair move to caution. One is working within the existing rules and one is simply asking for a cultural change. We also recommended that there be some very small changes in the way in which the House reports its records. And this is in part, I'm now in part speaking on behalf of the scholarly community that 100 years from now will look back to your records and will we'll have C-SPAN as the backup document. Uh, I think it would be very helpful if the, if the Congress would adopt the model of the court system and provide descriptions of the visual aids that are being brought to the floor. Not simply the visual aids that are problematic, but the visual aids in the form of the charts and the graphs. The advent of C-SPAN has made it possible for you to communicate much more effectively to the country by using charts and <coughs> graphs. And I don't think anyone would want to do anything to minimize the ability on complex matters in particular, such as the budget, to provide those kinds of clarifying data. But when one looks to the printed record, one doesn't see the charts that are being referred to. And as a result, one loses some of the impressiveness of the evidence that's being marshaled on behalf of the discourse on both sides. Because, as you know, you often have one side putting its interpretation of the data and the other side coming up to put its, its interpretation up well, as well. In other words, a form of discourse that is now more evidence-driven in some ways is being underreported. And secondly, by recording the visuals, it would make it possible for members to see those instances in which the chair has said that something is not appropriate. At right now, because of the nature of the process, someone will be told that something is inappropriate, but the record will not necessarily reflect it. As we were reading the record, for example, we found a discussion about a pig that was being passed around the floor. We would reasonably assume that you had not brought a pig onto the floor and that it was oinking and squealing, 
um, and thought that perhaps this was a stuffed pig. But you cannot tell that by reading the record. It would be appropriate, we think, for someone to make a notation in the record, and as a result, to make it possible for one of the offices of Congress to catalog those instances that were considered to be inappropriate to begin to give new members a sense of the parameters of visual discourse. Secondly, we think that it would be very helpful if we could record efforts to gavel down a member. Often when we found what we thought was inconsistency in the behavior of the Speaker Pro Tem, the Speaker Pro Tem in fact was intervening but not verbally. The Speaker Pro Tem was intervening by trying to gavel down. It would be important if one were to record that in the, in the record, however, that one note when the chair is gaveling to quiet the gallery rather than gaveling to quiet the floor. We also recommend some very small fine tuning in the existing rules. First, in the special order time, we think there's a parliamentary dilemma. I think special orders are one of the important discourse forms in the House because they provide extended times for expository discourse and some of the best case making by both the majority and the minority, the clarifying case making, occurs in special orders. But there's a dilemma during special orders when most of the gentlemen and gentle ladies of Congress are at home uh, having dinner, and that is that if a decision of the chair is appealed, you can't really reassemble the membership in order to carry the taking down process through. And as a result, on those rare occasions in which an individual is, is saying something that clearly during the regular discourse of the day uh, would, would be handled strongly with a request to take down, uh, we, we see that member simply cautioned by the chair. And think that if you considered changing the rules to say that appeals of the decision of the chair made after regular hours will be taken under consideration to be voted on at a specific time on the next legislative day, while in the meantime the member whose words have been, the demand of words have been taken down, would retain the right to speak for the rest of the day, but after the vote on the appeal from the ruling of the chair the following day, if the chair's ruling was sustained, permission would be required for the member to proceed in order. My guess is that if one had this rule change in place, one would minimize the tendency on the part of that very rare member to use that occasion to say things that that member would not have said during the regular day, and hence that it would have what academics inappropriately call a prophylactic effect. Secondly, when a member uses unparliamentary language, the words are taken down, they're stricken from the record, the member requires permission to regain speaking privileges for the day. But I couldn't find in your rules something comparable in a, as a form of a penalty for a member who threatens another member with violence or engages in an act of violence on the floor, in areas adjacent to the floor, or in committee meetings. I think it is appropriate to ask whether there shouldn't be something explicit that creates a sanction for members who engage, not in dueling, since I think that's not likely to come back, but in shoving, pushing, in threat to, to punch someone out, invitations to come off the floor to engage in a fist fight. Ordinarily in communication, one reserves one's strongest sanctions for physical actions and one's weaker sanctions for verbal actions, and the reverse appears to be true, although it's possible there's a rule someplace that I missed. The rest of our recommendations are about the culture. We think that there are some rules that are ordinarily applied in everyday communication with e other people, whether we agree or disagree, and that it would be, use be useful for people to simply remember them as they, they work through the legislative process. For example, when a member is named, questioned, or referred to by another, and that other person requests the opportunity to respond, we think that it would be appropriate as a, a, a cultural norm, not a rule, that that person be yielded to for response. Because for among other reasons, it lets the, uh, the debate advance. It advances the, the potential discussion. When a member plans to criticize another member on the floor, particularly during special orders, he or she, we think, should have the courtesy to notify that member. In the past, we found instances in which members of both parties have assumed that they should be granted those courtesies. And we think <coughs> that they're appropriate courtesies and that if one knows that that is the cultural expectation, one might be more careful about one says, what one says in those few problematic moments. We think secondly, in terms of cultural considerations, that when one side has repeatedly yielded to the other and the other then has the floor, it's courteous to reciprocate. Third, we think that when a member refuses to yield, the requests to yield should automatically cease. We think that when words are being withdrawn, the cultural norm should say it's inappropriate to repeat them in the act of agreeing to have the words withdrawn. And particularly repeating them on an ongoing basis becomes a way to circumvent the intent of the taking down process and magnifies tensions. And we think, fifth, that when a member indicates a willingness to apologize, the apology should be accepted 
that it ordinarily isn't appropriate within the culture when someone apologizes to, to say, no, we don't accept the apology, let's continue in a continuous sanctioning process. None of these things would take the form of any rule, anything within the rules. You don't set up rules in order to govern these sorts of things. But trying to establish a cultural expectation by having people behave in this way, we think in small discernible ways, would improve the climate for deliberation. We also think that it, it would be important to think about the, the roles that have been conventionalized in Congress and to ask if we could conventionalize some additional roles, not through rules, but through culture. We have observed over time, and we saw it in the 1940s as well as in the 1980s and 90s, that members on the minority side in particular, but occasionally the majority side as well, have begun to function as parliamentary watchdogs. And an individual has often assumed that role very ably. The parliamentary watchdog's job is to aggressively challenge procedure and process to ensure that the rights of that person's party are not being, being taken advantage of. We think that that's a perfectly appropriate role, but would ask whether it would not also be desirable to try to conventionalize a role for a person in each party who is to his tasked to try to ensure that if that member, the member of that party is edging toward impugning integrity, that the party itself begins to gently intervene in order to try to back down the tension in the exchange. We do, in fact, see these things happening on the floor, but we see them after the taking down process occurs, when often we see the senior respected members from the parties moving to try to get the, with the request withdrawn or to get the words withdrawn or to get an apology. We think that since you've already conventionalized that structure after the fact, there might be a way to conventionalize it by moving it a little bit forward in the process. We also think that as both parties proved in the debate over the Ethics Committee's recommendations on the Speaker in 1997, that the leaders in caucus can play a very important role when we know we're in a tense exchange in trying to ensure that the exchange stays focused on the issue and does not become an, a, a matter of personalities. In that instance, we saw very strong leadership on the part of both the Democrats and the Republicans, and we saw the Speaker pro tem issuing a statement that I think ought to be given to every new member, because I think it very well articulated the norms that ought to govern all debate in the House. We also think it would be appropriate for the staff people who handle press relations to remind reporters that the norm in the House is apologizing when there has been an infraction, and to focus attention on those apologies so that the audience in the form of the voting public is, likely, is more likely to realize that day to day this is not the norm and that when the norm is breached, the norm is also to apologize, often to apologize eloquently because the individual didn't mean to overstep and impugn the integrity of one of his or her colleagues. Our most controversial recommendation is that we either eliminate or move the one-minute speeches. I appreciate the importance of one-minute speeches, particularly because when the minority feels that it doesn't have much time to articulate its views, that becomes a forum for the minority. <clears throat> One-minute rules are not specified in the procedures of the House or the rules of the House. They are simply conventionalized into the House. But I would recommend this as the alternative because I appreciate the, the view on the part of whoever is in the minority. And I think it's healthy to have the Democrats in the minority and the Republicans in the minority enough in the lives of both of them so they experience the problems of being in the minority and are more sympathetic to the tensions of that relationship. I would recommend that if we move or eliminate one-minute speeches, we conventionalize Oxford debates as an additional forum available. In Oxford debates, strong partisanship should be the rule, but in an environment in which the debate structure increases the likelihood that one arbitrates evidence and doesn't engage in personalities. The third of your Oxford debates in 1994 was better than the second, which was better than the first. It takes time to learn this form. There isn't a lot of real debate in Congress anymore because of the way Congress is structured. I think the American people could come to view this as a form to learn deeply about issues, also to come to recognize that your differences are philosophical, not personal and that you all care about the well-being of the country, regardless of your political affiliation. Finally, I would ask that you consider increasing the vigilance of the speaker and of the members in some small ways. First, since there's no appeal from the speaker's recognition or non-recognition, I think the speaker needs to be cautious when you begin to see a pattern of inflammatory parliamentary inquiries during the taking down process. The best speakers pro tem were, were legislative chairs in their states and as a result are more comfortable acting in a nuanced fashion 
when you get into those subtle moments in which being able to determine what's appropriate and isn't to dampen down the tension is in order. And those people have often done that very well. Those who have had less experience in those tense moments are more likely to engage in a kinds of recognition that make, I think, the problems worse. Secondly, since members, according to the rules, are to be referred to as gentlemen or gentle lady from such and such a state, the speaker should intervene to caution against use of pejorative nicknames. I think, in fact, your rules tell the speaker that. But it hasn't been happening recently. For example, one member in recent times called another Stonewall and then her last name. Another called the gentleman Feel Good and then his last name. A third called another Closed Rule and then his last name. I don't think that's an appropriate way to refer to another member. And I think the speaker should, we should take the, the same expectation that the speaker has an obligation to intervene when the name of a member of the Senate is, is articulated or when a matter before a committee is articulated before it's come to the floor, the speaker should be proactive about assuming that name calling just isn't appropriate. That we are. One might uh, say that, that the positive statements that one, make, one, make an, one might make in adjective forms wouldn't be attached directly to the name. So one could then praise the gentle lady from for her championship of the open rule. Um, third, we think that to help members develop a clear sense of decorum, uh, whenever the chair feels that it would not be inflammatory, it would be useful to cite precedents and explain the justification for the ruling because we have many new members of Congress and we have many who have not served in state legislatures where the rules are, are very much the same as they are here. And that, that would be a useful way and a subtle way to increase the likelihood that the norms of the institution would carry forward. Finally, we would recommend that the parliamentarian's office publish a short, clear guide to behavior on the floor which could be given to new members at orientation, and I hope the orientation would have members of both party pres parties present, and that it would have both the parliamentary watchdogs and the, the comedy watchdogs instructing the members, not simply the parliamentary watchdogs. And it would, among other things, explain the principles governing the precedents and the explicit norms central to maintaining a climate of comedy. Your rules, I think, are very difficult for a new member to fathom particularly given the nature of the precedent structure here, and a clear guidebook would, I think, be helpful. In summary, the norm is a norm of comity. Strong, productive partisanship, I think, is better achieved in that kind of an environment. And just as the public reflected its disapproval of the first session of the 104th, with the disapproval level dropping to a point only exceeded in its depth by the point at which the House banking scandal was occurring, the country approved of the Congress in much higher proportions in the second session of the 104th. It may just be coincidental, but you got a lot more done in the second session, and also the level of civility by our markers was substantially higher. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. Uh, Don, proceed. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members of the subcommittee, it's good to see you all again. Um, I. Uh, I'm glad to have this chance to testify on civility in the House today, although I did not expect my first return visit to this committee would be as a witness. I sort of had hoped I'd be sitting in the audience uh, just watching the rest of you work for a change. It would be kind of nice. Um, I want to commend uh, Chairman Dreyer uh, on his leadership uh, in working with uh, Representatives LaHood and Skaggs and others in putting together the uh, bipartisan retreat in Hershey. I think it was a, a great idea. But more importantly, I want to commend uh, this subcommittee on following through on the spirit of Hershey and trying to develop some concrete recommendations for the leadership on how you might better uh, restore civility and comity in the House. Um, I recall very uh, distinctly last September when Representative Skaggs appeared before this committee and testified on the retreat concept. And he said something that struck me uh, quite profoundly at the time. I'd like to quote from that. It seems to me that what we are really talking about here is changing a culture and creating a different sense within the membership of the House of Representatives as to what the norms are here and what is appropriate and what isn't. Uh, that statement sort of uh, gnawed at me ever since because sometimes when you're so close to a situation for so long, you don't notice that the culture is slowly uh, changing around you. And that yet when I thought about it and after hearing that statement, uh, it, it hit me that it really had been uh, gradually changing in the House. Uh, what is this new culture? What's behind it? And uh, what do you do about it? Uh, I think that's why you're here today. And, my analysis uh, is, and it might be a little uh, exaggerated, but uh, I'm going to make the point anyway, that I think the culture in the House is slowly evolving from one of uh, governing through deliberation to one of perpetual campaigning through confrontation. 
Um, now, that would not be so bad if your campaigns were great uh, debates between the two parties on their uh, different philosophies and competing programs to solve important national problems. But I think Lincoln and Douglas would not recognize uh, campaigns today, uh, frankly. Um, campaigns today, I think, are driven primarily by polls, uh, pandering, personalities, and peccadilloes. Your professional campaign managers tell you that to, to win, you must demonize your opponent, uh, paint the issues in terms of good versus evil, avoid the tough issues, uh, oversimplify and magnify the importance of your key wedge issues, and attack, attack, attack. Well, to the extent that this campaign culture and these tactics are carried over to the House, it seems to me there will be no middle ground left for the type of compromise that is so necessary for effective governance. Uh, unlike a campaign, Congress is not a zero-sum game where you must destroy your enemy for you to succeed. Uh, here you must continue to work with your political opposition day after day after day. In fact, uh, many of you realize that today's political adversary on the House floor may well be tomorrow's ally if you have not alienated that person beyond speaking terms. Uh, the more that campaign tactics and wedge issues replace de deliberation over real problems, it seems to me the more there will be a breakdown in comedy and decorum that's necessary to sustain this system. Now, my analysis is not meant to be an indictment of any one or any party. I think both parties do it. Uh, we see a lot of the same things uh, from the, the White House, uh, the same type of political advice that flows from uh, the professional uh, campaign managers. Uh, indeed, a breakdown uh, in comedy in the House may well reflect what's happening in the uh, society at large, and that's the uh, uh, thesis of one of the succeeding witnesses here, Eric Guslaner, uh, who says that uh, there's a breakdown in trust among individuals at large in our society. But I think most members are concerned about this institution. Uh, they're upset by the collapse of comedy and civility, and uh, they prefer to work uh, in a culture of governance through deliberation rather than in a culture of a constant campaigning. Um, the response uh, to your retreat and the follow-on contacts and meetings that you have had, I understand, uh, really affirm this collective will of the House uh, to turn things around, and I think that's very encouraging. Um, Restoring civility and comedy, though, do not lend themselves to any kind of a uh, procedural or legislative quick fix uh, any more than you could legislate to morality. But it seems to me you can take certain steps to create an environment in which good uh, conduct is rewarded and bad con conduct is discouraged and punished. And that will require really going back to the basics, your basic rules on decorum in debate, learning them, teaching them, and enforcing them. Uh, Jefferson in his manual of parliamentary practice said that it's very important that you have a uniform set of rules so that, quote, order, decency, and regularity be preserved in a dignified public body. And that's what you want, a dignified public body. Uh, the rules of decorum were laid out. They're now in House Rule 14, but they were laid out during the first Congress seven days after it convened on April 7th, uh, 1789. They state quite simply the following, and I'm just uh, paraphrasing, but members shall address themselves directly to the chair, not to other members. Uh, they shall confine themselves to the question under debate. They shall avoid personalities in debate, including uh, not questioning another member's motives or integrity or veracity. And finally, if uh, they're called to order, they shall immediately sit down. It's been my observation over the years that there are three types of breaches of decorum of debate that you have in the House. Uh, the unthinking, or I should start with the unknowing, the unthinking, and the intentional. And each has to be dealt with uh, differently. The unknowing breaches by members who have not bothered to learn the rules. Uh, even, and this is not confined to junior members. A lot of senior members have not really bothered to learn the rules. Uh, to address this, you really have to have an ongoing educational effort by the parties, the parliamentarian, the chair, and your peers. In this regard, I want to commend the Rules Committee in uh, putting out this uh, pocket guide for members, uh, key forms of proceedings in the House of Representatives that tells a lot about what happens in the floor and why, the very back page of which is a summary of rules of decorum and debate. And uh, this is, I think, readily available now to all members on the House floor, and I think this is a great thing. I think it's the way to go. The second type of breach... That's right, it's also available on your website. I did see that just yesterday. The second type of breach is the unthinking breach, and that's committed by members who do know better, but in the heat of the moment, in a fit of passion or anger, uh, sort of forget themselves, and they fly off the handle, and they say some things that they shouldn't. Uh, obviously, there's no way you can uh, guard against this type of thing happening. It's a spontaneous outburst. 
but it should be recognized that they will occur during debates over uh, issues where there are great emotional divisions or great partisan divisions, or especially late at night when members are tired and, and nerves are, are taut and frayed anyway. I think in this situation, the leadership has to recognize that that type of uh, debate will trigger these outbursts, and the leadership should maintain a constant presence on the floor so they can immediately step in and help de-escalate the situation, and that the person responsible for that uh, unthinking outburst should be immediately ready to tender an apology to the House so that the House can get back uh, to the regular order. Uh, the third type of breach is the intentional breach. It's the most egregious, and I think it should be dealt with the most harshly. It's committed by those members who do know better, but to violate the rules of decorum uh, intentionally in order to provoke confrontation with the other side or to attract media attention. Um, and the intentional uh, breach members are the easy ones to spot. I mean, they're, they're repeat offenders. They've been uh, advised previously on these kind of violations and yet they persist in doing it day after day. I have recommended in this situation that the chair adopt a new approach, which I call two strikes and you're out. That is, if the chair cautions a member that he's engaging in improper conduct, engaging in personalities, and that member persists in that type of conduct, the chair exercises clear authority under Clause 4 of Rule 14 and order that member to immediately sit down. I've recommended a similar thing when it comes to uh, exhibits uh, that are uh, in violation of the, the rules of decorum. It's, and I call it one strike and it's out. That is, if a poster or some visual display uh, is brought to the floor, a point of order is sustained that it is not in, order, in keeping with the decorum of the House, the Speaker should order the Sergeant at Arms to remove that display from the House floor, from the chamber altogether, and that no other member can use that same poster to provoke another point of order later in that day or even in any subsequent day. It's already been established that that is out of order. Uh, in this regard, I have another recommendation, that is you repeal uh, Rule 30 of the House regarding exhibits. That rule now says that if anybody objects to an exhibit on the floor, there's an automatic vote as to whether to allow it. Well, this has been abused uh, by the minority just to get dilatory votes, just as the Republican minority used to abuse the rule on reading of papers in the House in order to get dilatory votes. That rule was repealed. This rule should be repealed. Uh, it seems to me, though, beyond the minority uh, tactics, the majority could abuse the current rule by uh, objecting to a perfectly legitimate minority exhibit and then getting a vote on that and having it taken off the floor on a party line vote. If you repeal this rule, you still have a point of order against improper exhibits. You still have an appeal to the ruling of the chair. You could have a vote, but it won't be used for partisan purposes. I suspect the chair will probably be upheld in those situations. Uh, on one minute, um, I have a compromise between abolishing one minute speeches and moving them to the end of the day. And that is this that at the beginning of the day you allow for one minute announcements, that is announcements of a factual nature. You've introduced a bill, you're in inviting co-sponsors, you have a discharge petition, you're inviting signatories, you have an important meeting in your committee or hearing you'd like to invite uh, members to pay attention to, uh, you have an important constituent achievement that you'd like to announce to the House and so on. Uh, factual nature, uh, uh, one minute would be okay. Um, and this would be sort of a House bulletin board. Uh, one minute of a political nature that you get involved with views uh, on policy and legislation on politics, whatever, would be moved to the end of the day just prior to special orders. So that's my suggestion on one minute. I do have a final section uh, that uh, I will not take the time to, to go into in any detail. It simply cautions you against thinking that if you restore civility and comedy in the House, that somehow you will restore public confidence in this institution. Some of the reading I've been doing recently indicates to me that even if you are perfectly polite to each other, as long as you are having any kind of partisan differences, any kind of compromises are involved, any kind of prolonged deliberations, any kind of perception that you are somehow reconciling competing interests, which the public see as special interests, then this is messy, this is bad, they don't want to see it. So I think you're going to have to somehow work through that, how we better educate the public that the diverse interests that you are dealing with are really their diverse interests and not that you're not just doing something that is out of order. And I think that's a hard one to overcome. Sam Rayburn, the Speaker of the House, once said, for too many critics of Congress mistake its deliberations for its decisions, and I think that's true. Uh, let me just conclude by saying that uh, I think partisanship is good in the best sense of the term. Uh, it uh, simply means that uh, you uh, have a, a view, a, a belief, and a program of your party that you adhere to, and I think that is uh, a sign that our system is healthy. We have full and free-ranging debates over these competing solutions and, and beliefs. Uh, I think it's something we should celebrate rather than something we should somehow say that uh, we, it, we think is disgusting. I think it's good that you have your differences. Uh, you would not have this opportunity in a one-party or a no-party state. 
Let me just conclude by quoting a, a, a Russian visitor to our shores in the early part of the century. His name was Boris Marshalov, and he was taken to the house gallery across the hall here. And he came away from watching the house in action, and he had the following observation. Congress is so strange. A man gets up to speak and says nothing. Nobody listens. And then everybody disagrees. <laughs> well, I've related the story to make two concluding points. First, some things don't change. And second, an American visitor to our gallery would come away and not think that's strange at all. Why? Well, I think it's because we uh, have a great tradition of open dissent and disagreement. Maybe we take it for granted, but people recognize this is the way our democracy works. So may you just continue to thrash out your differences and disagreements uh, with deliberation and civility. Thank you. Thank you very much, Don, and thank you, Kathleen. Uh, both of you were talking about uh, what, at this moment, can certainly be considered uh, extraordinarily timely. Uh, on the House floor, uh, we are getting ready to vote on uh, whether uh, members' uh, words are to be taken down. The, uh, I was just told this by staff. I don't know exactly what the vote is, but uh, there apparently was just a real ruckus during the one minutes that have taken place. And uh, so we are uh, going to be going downstairs to do that. I have loads of questions and want to uh, proceed. Uh, with uh, a discussion. I don't know if any, uh, if, if you two and others who are here want to go uh, across into the speaker's gallery, if there's room there to, to see uh, what is taking place, because we are going to recess. But before we do, let me call on uh, the vice chairman of the committee to see if he'd like to begin with any questions. Mr. Chairman, I thank you, but uh, I, uh, I would uh, rather, after the uh, recess, uh, resume the debate. And uh, I do look forward to finding out what we're going to vote on before we do vote on it. Tony, do you want to? I think it's a good time to wait until they, if they can come back, and uh, we can all. Is that all? Is that all right with everybody here? Okay, we're gonna we're gonna stand in recess, and we'll try and come back. Uh, well, I'll speak to the members of the subcommittee uh, before we uh, come back, but we're gonna go to the floor for this, and you all are certainly welcome to go across. And I know there's a television in here too, so we'll try to come back uh, at a mutually agreeable time in the, the not too distant future. Thank you very much. Sorry, I didn't have a chance to. Yeah. I'll just leave this one.